Hi everyone and welcome to the latest Top Marks video which is all about cultural capital. We have also created a video on social capital and another on an introduction to Marxism and so if you haven't already you might want to take a look at those two in order to get to grips with some of the key ideas and the terminology used in this video. To get the most out of this video you might want to watch it all and then write down what you can remember or take notes as you watch and listen, refining them at the end. Feel free to draw too, whatever works for you. So. Let's begin with the idea of capital as a start. For simplicity, capital is something that a person might possess. And in sociology, we can consider capital being split into three forms, economic, social and cultural. These terms tend to come up most often when discussing inequalities, particularly with regards to social class, but it can also be applied to ethnicity, age and gender inequalities. We won't go into too much detail here, but discussions of capital closely linked to life chances, which is a term coined by the sociologist Max Weber and describes the likelihood of a person gaining access to opportunities, experiences and material goods. A person's life chances are improved if they, for example, have people in their family that have been to university or if they have enough money to buy a house or start their own business. In short, high levels of capital tend to increase life chances. So let's begin by outlining what economic capital is before moving on to cultural capital. Economic capital is fairly straightforward to understand. This is essentially money, which of course can be gained from working or owning land and property and so on. In Western cultures particularly, this is typically passed down through generations of families via inheritance, as well as being earned through labour. Economic capital, as you're probably aware, benefits the individual in that they are able to pay for resources and opportunities that are likely to benefit them in some way, such as going to private school or owning a large and comfortable house. Most people tend to agree and understand that having economic capital is advantageous and that lacking it can reduce opportunities. So that's economic capital. Cultural capital is a little more complex to grasp, but we can look at some examples in a moment to help. To start with, cultural capital is defined as wealth in the form of knowledge or ideas which legitimate the maintenance of status and power. Put simply, possessing cultural capital is knowing how the systems that make up society work and knowing how to act in certain situations in order to fit in with the dominant culture, which according to Marxists and neo-Marxists is the culture of the bourgeoisie, i.e. the rich and powerful. Karl Marx, who, no prizes for guessing, was the founder of Marxism, argued that the bourgeoisie not only control what he called the base of society, that is the economic aspect, but also the superstructure, that is the politics, laws, media, education system and so on. In short, the culture of capitalist society is not chosen by most of its members, but instead imposed upon them as something that they don't even think to question. Now, it's not a textbook example, but one I like to start with when explaining cultural capital is in the film Titanic, if you have seen it. Hear me out. There's a scene where Leonardo DiCaprio's character, Jack, who is from a working class background, is invited to a formal dinner with Kate Winslet's character, Rose, and her family, who are no doubt in the upper class. At the table, Jack is presented with four sets of cutlery to eat with. After another diner, Molly notices his perplexed expression. She discreetly whispers to him to start on the outside and work his way inwards. This knowledge of which cutlery to use and when i.e. how to act and behave in certain situations, is a great example of cultural capital at play. For a more rigorous sociological reference, the neo-Marxist Pierre Bourdieu is a good place to start. He is the sociologist most closely associated with cultural capital. It was he who really coined the term. Amongst other things, Bourdieu used the idea of cultural capital to explain differing levels of attainment between working class and middle class children at school. So, in UK state schools, for example, the attainment of working class students, on average, is worse than that of middle class students. This is despite the fact that schooling is free, and therefore this cannot be explained by money alone. Instead, Bourdieu explained this pattern by arguing that middle class parents transmit cultural capital to their children through things like reading certain books and newspapers at home, or taking children to art galleries and museums. This means that at school, middle class children are already familiar with these things, have some understanding of them and find it easier to engage and advance in their learning as a result. So, for example, if you think back to primary school, you might remember your teacher announcing that the class was going to do a project on, say, the Egyptians or Picasso that term. 
Let's say your parents had recently taken you to an exhibition about one of those. That would put you at a huge advantage because you would already know a bit about that topic and feel that it was something that relates to your home life. You'd probably feel more comfortable and familiar with school as a result, find it easier to engage in the learning and participate, and therefore be more likely to produce excellent work and attain excellent grades. Cultural capital is certainly not limited to school, however. It applies to all life stages and ages, and, as mentioned previously, it can be used to explain other inequalities, such as those related to age, ethnicity and gender. So, neo-Marxists suggest that young and older people, rather than those that are middle-aged, ethnic minorities and women arguably have less cultural capital than the white male majority. Why? Well, remember, cultural capital is largely about fitting in with the dominant culture, and neo-Marxists argue that the dominant culture is determined by the middle and upper classes, who, historically, and to a large extent currently, are white, wealthy and male. As an example, let's consider how cultural capital might affect life chances in the workplace. Let's say a person got a job in a prestigious law firm. They would be more likely to fit in if they knew which clothes were most appropriate to wear in the office. This is something that might be learnt through age and experience. So, over time, we learn when and where it's appropriate to wear a tie, and where you can get away with wearing chinos rather than suit trousers. In addition, many companies and corporations have outdated social events on the calendar that may exclude certain groups, such as golf tournaments geared towards male employees, or after-work drinks that may exclude certain faiths, such as Muslims. Having cultural capital and fitting in could even be as simple as knowing which cultural activities you should mention enjoying and those that you should leave out. So, in this prestigious law firm, a person who possesses cultural capital might know that it's a good idea to mention their passion for theatre to colleagues, rather than disclosing that they also religiously watch Love Island every year. You might be thinking, does it really matter if a person wears slightly different clothes and expresses their love of ITV reality shows? It's as simple as this. If a person fits in with their colleagues, particularly those working above them, they are more likely to be seen in a favourable light and, importantly, may be more likely to be promoted as a result. That's the neo-Marxist argument anyway. So, that's an introduction to cultural capital and why it matters. To sum up then, economic capital is about the money you possess and cultural capital is all about the knowledge of systems and how to behave in certain situations, which Marxists and neo-Marxists argue is decided by the ruling class. If you want to find out more, there is plenty out there. This video only scratches the surface. Do have a closer look at studies and writing from Bourdieu, who coined the term cultural capital, and also the term habitus, which you might find useful to use in conjunction with it. A sociologist called Basil Bernstein also conducted a famous study on what he called elaborate and restricted codes, which further explains children's advantage and disadvantage at school, specifically with regards to their use of vocabulary. More recent studies by Beverly Skeggs, Valerie Hay, Val Gillies and Anthony King and Daniel Smith highlight cultural capital and how it is used in the workplace, education and within peer groups. There are some great documentaries out there too. BBC's How to Break into the Elite and Channel 4's Too Poor for Posh School both have great examples of cultural capital in action. Have a look and see what you can spot. Before we finish then, some questions that you might want to consider are What do you think is most important in determining life chances? economic or cultural capital? Do you think what counts as cultural capital will ever change over time? Will it ever, for example, be seen as more desirable to know how to pull a pint over being able to talk confidently about classical music or paintings? And what might functionalists say about all of this? Would they agree that cultural capital is key in determining life chances? Don't forget that you can subscribe to Top Marks in order to stay up to date with all the latest revision videos just hit the subscribe button below. Thanks for watching and I hope this helps you on your way to sociology success.